Euh, bonjour à tous. Euh, je vais commencer par des remerciements. Remercier les organisateurs de m'avoir invité à animer la session de ce matin. Donc, euh, je m'appelle Jean-Nicolas Bézel. Je fais partie du Conseil scientifique de la Réserve naturelle nationale de Grandlieu. C'est à ce titre, je pense, que j'ai été contacté. Je suis enseignant-chercheur à l'École nationale du génie de l'eau et de l'environnement de Strasbourg, l'ENGES, où je suis euh, donc euh, chargé de travailler sur les hydrosystèmes euh, d'un point de vue écologique. Donc je fais de l'écologie des milieux aquatiques. Voilà, donc euh, pour la session de ce matin, nous allons ouvrir avec une conférence euh, introductive, dont le titre est « Vers une approche intégrée de la gestion des lacs, expérience aux Pays-Bas » dans un contexte européen, et nous allons écouter M. Medobar van Erden du service de l'eau, ministère de l'Infrastructure et de l'Environnement des Pays-Bas. Euh, la conférence devrait durer une vingtaine de minutes, ce qui nous laissera l'opportunité d'avoir un petit échange juste après. Voilà. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me uh, to this wonderful uh, lake uh, of Grand Lieu. I realized that it was about 30 years ago in 1987 that I was uh, sailing on this lake investigating a little bit with Loïc Marion. And uh, since then, uh, I, I kept this impression of the Lac de Grand Lieu to my home country, which is the Netherlands, because in Oostvaardersplassen we have a similar type of lake I will tell you a little bit about and uh, the inspiration has ever lasted. So today we will go and see what we did in the Netherlands. You know the Netherlands is a very low-laying country and the half of the Netherlands would not be there if there was no constant pumping of water out of our uh, lakes and canals and we did a lot of uh, embankment But today we will see what it, what it meant in terms of water quality and nature restoration because it's not only the, the human functions that are important, but of course also those lakes are in very, very important for, for nature. So what will we do? So our organization um, is concerned with the, with the quality of, of the waters in the Netherlands. And we have some 85 years nowadays of experience of coastal zone management. And we will see what it has, uh, has brought us. Then we will zoom in a little bit to the IJsselmeer area, which is the large lake in the center of our, uh, our system. It's called IJsselmeer since 1932. We will talk a little bit about water framework directive and Natura 2000 legislation. Of course, that is all relatively new to our uh, system. We were working there for another 30 years or longer, but then suddenly those European legislation came to our system. And we can see how important is all this knowledge and monitoring in the European situation. In 1932, there was a big barrier dam constructed in the northern part of the lake. And at that time, The Zuiderzee, which is a, a sturine situation, became a lake. So there was a big brackish water situation uh, over 30 kilometers of width, which changed into a freshwater situation. And then more embankments followed. The reason for, for, for doing this one, the big one here, was a flood in 1916 where people got drowned. So it was a political point to say, okay, we have to do something and build a barrier dam. And other flood in this area in 1953 caused again more than 1,000 people to die, big disaster, and people said, okay, we have to change again the situation. The Veersemeer, the Lauersmeer in the north, the Haring fleet, you see all the, all the dates Kramer Volkerak, Markizat, and Eastern Skeld. And by the color, you can see that all these, these ones became freshwater lakes, light blue. One remained a, a brackish water lake, and two remained saline waters. So big changes over 80 years. So a lot of uh, man-made wetlands, man-made new situations. Now we zoom in into the Isselmeer area. 
The dam was constructed 32 kilometers in 1932. It was straight. It was a masterpiece of civil engineering works. Everybody proud. It's still on the, on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Only South Korea has now a dam two kilometers longer, so we are a little bit uh, sorry about that. And then this was the project by Cornelis Lely. He was an engineer, and he constructed within that lake polders in 1930, 1942, 57, 68. You see all the, that area was embanked, so taken from the lake, all this area. So about 165,000 hectares of polders were constructed in this lake, so water went away, and this was remaining. Still huge, it's one of the biggest lakes in Europe, but about half the size it originally was. And then Lely had the last polder planned in this southwestern corner because it was silty area. But at that time, it was about 1980, people realized that it was not only agriculture and man-made functions, but also recreation, drinking water, transport over water, other functions of water that were important. And this last polder was never developed. So it was a major change of the original plan. It's important. The, the society changed and the plan changed. No, I don't know. Here you see the names. So in the northern part we call it Isselmere. Markermere is the southwestern part. So there is one dike that was dividing this system here into two parts because it was the first dike for the last polder that was projected here, but it never came. So we split our lake into two parts, which caused, of course, biological effects. And this is the border lakes, very shallow zone. And then water is not just water. The soil underwater determines very much the biological conditions. In our case, it's the sandy part in the north and the clay parts in the southwest. And there's a lot of silt deposited in this lake. Silt is coming from the river. The river is entering here in the system. And silt is transported, especially here in the deeper gullies. But also, after the closure of the dike, of this dike, there was a new equilibrium because a lot of erosion, wave induced erosion, occurred in the western part due to the southwesterly winds and a lot of silt deposited in the northeastern part of this separated part of the lake. And here you see this as a map of change. The deeper gullies from the tidal area still became sedimented. You see here in the pink and the, and the, and the, and the reddish colors, the change of, of depth. So the gradients disappeared. It's very important to realize that a lake is ne never a lake at itself. It is always connected to some river, to the, to the environment. And in our case, the Isselmere, of course, is part of the Rhine catchment area. So all the way from Switzerland, from eastern France, from a large part of Germany, water enters to our, our lake. So bringing all the nutrients to our lake, but also the pollutants, medicine, hormones, everything is, is, is getting to this, this end part of the system. So let's have a look at the water quality. In the 1980s, water quality was poor. There was a lot of nutrients in the water, and this could be the image in August. Blue-green algae were covering large parts of the lake. There were no more macrophytes, so aquatic plants died because of the algae. And then we said we have to do something. And it was a tremendous success in one way that already in the 80s people realized this, this is not nature. We should do something. And due to international collaboration with the Germans and the French, the water uh, purification resulted in a tremendous reduction in, in the decrease of phosphorus. You see here in the logarithmic scale. So a factor 10 was, was achieved in just 20, 25, 30 years. And here you see all the different lakes in our system. 
One lake is lagging beh behind. It was our own lake, Amir, which received water still from agriculture, local agriculture. But all the lakes receiving the lake, uh, the, their water from the Rhine went faster down. So a tremendous reduction in nutrients. And with that reduction, you see the increase in water transparency. But it took many years. So we were going down already in phosphate, but nothing happened in the lake until the mid-90s, the mid-1990s, and then the system reacted and water quality really and water transparency became larger. And that caused a response in macrophytes, the aquatic plants. Here you see stonewort, cara, and cara came back, especially in the shallow, shallowest part of our lake system, the border lakes. Here an example in Lake Veluwemeer. And you see how it developed in the bars. In 1990 it was completely absent, and suddenly it started in the mid-90s, and then further up it boosted more or less, around 2000 and now it fluctuates new new species come but the situation is much better than it was and here you see that the system responded in a lot of a lot of way but not in a similar way this is the cara part the stonewort part where you just saw the picture but in other part you have nitilopsis and you have potomogaton and potomogaton on the frisian coast here Potomogaton and other species, Perforiatus on the western coast of the Markamir. So the total macrophyte composition depends on soil, on the exact level of the nutrients, and as such the system is, is having a big biodiversity, even in, in water plants. It's not just one direction, no, it's several directions. And the most purified place is here. And then it's interesting to see what birds have done. This is an example of the Buick swan. It's one of the swans that's coming from Russia to winter in our area. And this is the distribution of the swans recently. And you see this pattern of swans. We have about 40% of all the swans in the flyway population coming to the Netherlands. And they are in this lake system, exactly distributed according to where the macrophytes are. And in general, the macrophyte eaters, in terms of birds, bird numbers, increase because of the amelioration of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the water quality. As an example here, the coot, the fulk, you see the numbers here in the Markamir generally going up, especially the, 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 the recent numbers are higher than ever. But what about bentos? What about fish? There's more than just water plants. And the open water system is something special. The borders, the zones near the shore, is something, but the open water is a special habitat. And these are the avian players in that habitat. So these are the Natura 2000 bird species for, we, for which we have international uh, 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 responsibility. Nice birds, nice to see, sometimes eating fish like cormorants, not, not wanted so much, but very important. And this is the Buick swan, you saw just the image before, coming all the way from Russia, from the Petchora Delta, which is an area, it looks a little bit like the Netherlands, but it's intact, there's no dams there, there's a lot of brackish water, pools, and so on. So in summer, all the swans are in Russia, and in winter, they are in our region. Imagine that it is very important, in terms of thinking of your lake management, that birds fly all the way along a lot of stopover sites to forage, to enter in, in a certain winter area. It's not just having your lake in itself. No, th the lake in itself is connected, through birds at least, to many other flyway level lakes. If we arrange the birds in, ter in terms of feeding gills, then you say, okay, this is the plant eaters, the fish eaters, and the mussel eaters. And you see the species arranged by feeding gills. And if you then see how it is now, this was the image of 1980, in terms of size of the image, is size of the population in our lake. 
then you see that especially here the fish eaters and the mussel eaters have declined. We go back to see it once more. You see the plant eaters were, were less than and then recently especially the fish eaters and the mussel eaters have declined. Why is that? We need food web studies, so you have to know what's going on in your system. In our system, smelt is very important. It's a very uh, important small fish, a leftover from the Zuider Zee, and fresh, wa fresh water mussels. Those two are the main uh, food sources for all these water birds. And this is the mapping of the freshwater mussel, Dreisena, the zebra mussel. And the larger the dot, the more mussels. And you see the most mussels are there where the outflow of the river is. This is the river entrance, entrance in the lake. And here you see the largest number of mussels. But also here on the west coast and here in the northern part. But partly there are no mussels. And that's because of the silt. Where there is silt and soft bottom, there is no mussels. The interesting point here is that if you, if you calculate in relation to the water depth and the calorific value of the mussels, then in red you see the amount of mussels that is available to diving ducks. So only the red, the red symbols indicate the proportion of mussels that is available to ducks. The green are too deep or have too low energy content. That's interesting to know in relation to carrying capacity. Not every food item counts. And you see that it differs from the in, in between the different areas of the lakes. In the northern part, where the open waters predominate, the fraction available is less than in the southwestern part. Here all mussels can be eaten, here about half, and here less than one-third. And Dreisena is also going down. Here you see two charts. We have many more charts. In 99, it was still present in huge numbers. But in, after the year 2000, numbers went down. Distribution remained more or less the same, but numbers and stock density went down. And then other mussel came, also a freshwater mussel. This is the quagga mussel. This is Dreisena polymorpha, and this is Dreisena bugensis. Well, you may say it's just the same, but it's not. It's a species. And it came from the Black Sea area. And why did it come? Did it fly like a bird? No. It just went through the water by ship, by ship passage because we connected the Danube system and the Rhine system through the, mine, the Danube mine channel. And because of that, the mussel could invade our system just because the systems are now, nowadays connected. And you see this new mussel takes over from Dreisena, first in the southern part, and now it's already spread over the entire lake. So the politicians say, okay, there's no problem because a new mussel, thanks, great, no problem. We'll come back to that in a, in a slide. The nutrients went down and the total species composition increased. So a new mussel, but many other species entered the lake, Potomopyrgus, Pisidium, Chamarus, Viviparus, Sferium, Falvata, species that were always there, but in minor numbers, but now they are expanding slowly, we think, in relation to the declining uh, nutrient load. And birds, the diving ducks, also responded to this new situation. This is stomachs of scorp, Aetia marilla, so 14 birds, coming from different areas in the lake, and you see they eat at different places different things. Here's the two mussels, Dreisena polymorpha, and here Bugensis. So it doesn't matter a duck what is there, it just goes there and takes what it can, but then of course it realizes, or it realizes, yeah, what is in the mussel. That's very important, how much flesh is in the mussel. That's where it counts, because each day a diving duck feeds on its own body weight in freshwater mussel. So if you weigh 1500 grams as a diving duck, you eat your own body size 
in terms of freshwater mussels. Cold, four degrees, heat them up um, until 41 degrees, and the shit comes out at the, at the other outer end. And only that tiny little bit of flesh is what, where it counts for the, for, the, for the bird. And then you see that this newcomer, the Dreisena bugensis, who does better now under low nutrient content, has lower energy value. You see larger muscles here generally have, have more energy content, but polymorpha is far better than the newcomer. So this means that the carrying capacity of our lake is going down. Oh, oh. And the bentos eaters are going down too. You, here you see an example of Bucephala clangula, the golden eye, the numbers again. Then the fish. It's an interesting story because many of the fish in the Zuiderzee disappeared. But one remained, and that was the smelt, Osmeris aperlanus. And Osmeris stayed very small. In the Zuiderzee, they became this big because they went to the North Sea and came back after three years to spawn in this area. After the closure of the dam in 32, the species only remained six, seven centimeters and spawned after one year. Only a few spend another season and then they die because there's no more food. The food remains smaller, so the species had, had to adapt, but it could adapt. <coughs> A few ones reach the predatory size. And the species is very, com very common in the lake, and it is important for birds, but also for, for predatory fish, like pike perch, perch, and other species. So fishermen are dependent on the species. And the distribution of the smelt is related to the zooplankton, because it's a planktivore species. And that's opposite as where the Dreisena is. So the soft bottoms in the parts of the lakes, in the eastern part of the Markamir, and where the gullies are in the northern part, that's where the plankton is. Where the Dreisena is not, that's where the fish is. And again we see a dramatic fall in the stocks. So in the 80s, when the nutrients were very high, we reached peak biomass of the fish. And then, this is monitoring results, it went down, especially after the mid-90s, it's going down, and even the last years, it's further going down. And what you also see is that the tiny fraction of one plus is even disappearing completely, so the fish even stays smaller than it, than it were before. But fishermen, of course, like this fish. This fish is being transported to Japan, it's a kind of sushi, I don't know. And they were caught during spawning. Everybody said, okay, it's a salmonid species, no problem. It spawns and it dies, so we can fish them during spawning. And they did so until 2012. It was the last year that it was allowed. It was a very clean fishery, but going to the spawning places, they were very efficient in taking a large part of the fish away for the birds. And the birds, you see here, as an example of the great crested grebe, declined. People saw this and say maybe it's fluctuations, but it was not. It was a general trend. So the factors affecting the trends in water birds is various. It's not one, one factor. We have a silt problem in the southern part of the lake due to the making of the, the separation of the two lakes. The pea load in the water, the phosphorus load, is going down. So production is going down as well. The compartments sometimes are difficult to pass for fish, birds, and the fishery pressure is still high because fishery yeah, is, a, is an important reason to be there. They have their, the, the, the old rights, but they continue just to catch and catch. And there's climate change. Our, our winters are milder. Our summer, summers get hotter, like everywhere in Europe. And new predators arrive. I explained to you about the new muscle, the Rhine-Danube connection, which, which causes problems. And there's more disturbance, because people want to recreate on these lakes. Why not? Amsterdam is close, so let's go to the lake. And this is, of course, where we have to think about. This is the large numbers of 
waterfowl that is present on the lake. This is an image of Scorp, Aitia Marilla, on the northern part of the lake. It's not only the presence of mussels, but it's also the size of the habitat. Scorp is not never occurring in small waters, in small lake systems, no scorp. Scorp is a semi-sea duck, and it wants to have open, open horizon, big, vast areas. This is another one, Aitia Ferina. And here you can see how they distribute in the lake system of the Isselmere. So these are all these separated lakes in our system. And this is the abundance of this scorp in over the years. And you saw in the beginning they were only in the biggest lakes, Markermere and Isselmere. But as soon as the water plants returned in the border lakes, the birds shifted from here to here. Whereas total numbers, although fluctuating, were more or less stable. So the birds are moving in between the lakes. And that means that in Natura 2000 context, you have targets. You have to have so many birds in exactly that lake. And we think this should be enlarged a little bit to say, okay, it's maybe not one lake to another, but see it a little bit in a larger perspective. See it as a system, because birds can readily move in between the lakes. So what can we do? Because the situation now is not ideal, as I just explained. We have artificial shores, a fixed water table. What can we do? We thought habitat restoration could help us. So it's the interface between the water and the land that could help us in increasing the carrying capacity of a lake. I show you now some examples of this. Nature development, islands and foreshores. Here, an example of the of the Durgedam, the Kinsel, Kinselmere area, where there was a new island created as a compensation measure of the extension of part of the Amsterdam city into the lake. So Amsterdam <laughs> wanted to build a little bit in the lake, big debate, and then people said, okay, then you have to compensate and bring something back to nature. And this was then the result. So a better um, uh, situation in terms of land, shallow water and inland waters. Interesting. This was another one. We constructed a naviduct. So ships are now sailing across a road. So you can just cross a road in a ship, a naviduct, a sailable naviduct, with the sluice even. So that was for engineers heaven. But nature, of course, yeah, was a little bit on the other end of, this, of the story. So we constructed this new land by pumping sand, clay, and other materials. And you can see here it started. We, we constructed this barrier dam to, to prevent it from being e eroded. And then you see here the willows germinating just by itself because this is the silty area. This is the sandy, sandy part. And here it is lower. And here was another pumping, pumping place. So the pumping pipe bringing in new sediments was placed in several compartments and that you can use that in a way to construct new wetlands. This is a more artificial one, but it's a very interesting one too. It's a, it's a bird island because there were no safe breeding areas for birds in this lake. And especially here, this is white sand for terns, but also we we had low low area area islands, a complex of 15 islets. It's only 70 hectares large, but it meant a big change in the functioning of our lake because nowadays black tern from Russia in August sleep exactly on that, on that new island because they can roost safely for foxes. There are no foxes there. And the terns, the common terns, Tena Irundo, fishing on the, on the smelt, I explained you earlier, is breeding there now in larger number uh, than ever in, in, in the Netherlands. So more than 4,000 breeding pairs on this new man-made island. And also behind the dike, you can do something. So part of the polder Zuid-Flevoland was not designated into farmland, but was developed as a big marsh. 
Oostwaardersplassen, that was the marsh that, that, that partly inspired us from, from Grandlieu. There you see it. So the lake is here. There is a dike separating the two parts. This is the deepest part of the polder. It's 6,000 hectares, so that was something to decide as a politician, give, give 6,000 hectares away to nature. At first, the barrier was here, carefully designed, because there was a spoonbill co colony at that time when it was designed here. And later on, we had to plan the railway from Amsterdam to Lelystad. And then there was a big discussion, where the railway, because the planner said the railway should go here. And this should be given to farmers as well. And then we said, also in, in connection to, 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 to Grand Lieu, there should be a border zone. And this is the, the, the border zone. And we added part of, of wetlands, which were already designated as farmland. You can see the parceling out had, has been going on. And we gave it back to nature to increase the size of the wetland that you have a marsh part and a, and a wet meadow part because that in, in, in connection is so important. And then we saw that a big marsh functions in a different way than a small marsh because this is a little bit difficult to see but this is reed beds and the reed bed border is here and these grey leg geese, answer, answer, are coming to a huge wetland in order to molt so they cannot fly for 35 days. And in that period, they graze down, they defoliate the phragmitis until where the water is. This is the water edge of last year. So the reed is growing in the spring and the geese are feeding on it in June. And it's a defoliation, a complete defoliation. But that helps the reed beds to be managed because what is being caused Shoveler, Anas Clipiata, is feeding on zooplankton. It's a specialist duck. But because of all the goose faces, the goose shit, you may say, there's a lot of recycling of nutrients. The leaves of the, of the, of the phragmitis are turned into the, to the water system, give an algal bloom, and followed by that, a zooplankton bloom. And this gives opportunity for thousands of shoveler to mold there as well. And also the structure of the reeds changed because of the grazing of the geese. So the geese are opening by their grazing the reeds. They fragment it. And because of this, spoonbills and great white egrets can breed, like here in, uh, in Grand Lieu. So water table management is very important as an as a additional measure. Without, we would be just having one big lake without any vegetation. And the border zone is grazed. If you have no grazing, you have no grass. And grass is also very important for voles, for geese, and so on. So we have introduced grazes, cattle, horse, and red deer, as you see here. Oh. And then we had inspiration from Lake Pipsy on the border of Russia and Estonia, which is about the size of our system but with a natural water table management. So a lot of differences with our system. Water table differences within the season, but also between years. Pipe C has a 11 years cycle with high waters and low waters and high waters and low waters. And that is probably essential for macrophyte development like phragmitis because there is parts where birds have more access to the phragmitis and other periods they have not, and the reeds can extend into the water. The natural shores, and this is the outlet of the Velikaya uh, in, in the southern part of the lake, of that lake, and you can see it's, it's wetlands all around. This is a natural river entering a lake, which inspired us very much to reconstruct our lake. Reed beds in the lake, vast, and of course, it's a little bit dreaming because we will never get our system into a pipe sea like system because there's many more people and eutrophication is higher in our system. Here it is still lower. And there's peat box and fans connected to this lake, hydrologically connected. 
And then we realized that we could do a little bit in our region. This is Oostwaardersplassen. Could we then develop some new marsh in the open part of Markermeer? An area not exactly a copy as Oostwaardersplassen, but something in hydrologically connected. And we dreamed about 4,000 to 6,000 hectares of a new marsh, giving the opportunity for new avian visitors, maybe Dalmatian pelican, because in Roman times we had Dalmatian pelicans near Rotterdam, where is now Rotterdam. So connecting wetlands within your system is very important. And can we realize that? We needed two years of negotiation with politicians, with stakeholders. But then it was there. Marker Wadden now is under construction. In 2016 we started here in this area. We continue this year with another three islands and we hope to finish next year at least the first part. And then it is up to the politicians to, to decide to go on because this then will be 600 hectares at a cost of 65 million euros, which is quite a lot of money for nature only. And it's very interesting. So last year we started. It's huge. It's in the open water. And it's four meters water depth, not destroying Dreisena, not destroying the fish, but there where the values, the natural values were lowest. Birds readily discovered the island immediately in August last year. Black tern and common tern were visiting. So we had a series of nature development plans around our shores because we think it is important. These are the inland ones realized and in the water as well. And in combination, you can do a lot, partly realized, partly under study. So this might be, at least that is our approach, the land-water inter interface is very important to, to, to restore because the first aim was to have agricultural polders with a very steep gradient in the water. There's one more that is very important, that is the connection to the Wadden Sea. And this is the fish migration river for the Salmonids. This is, this is a very huge project here depicted. So salmon can then enter the big barrier dam separating the lake. But it's a long way. The brackish zone will still be, be a dream because we hoped to have a brackish zone, a real transition, but we have only the fish migration way. We have new nature. The white-tailed eagle is breeding now, whereas it was never before. We have clear water. That's a good point. But we have also space invaders, a lot of new gobies, crayfish, etc. And wind, en wind energy, sand mining, water recreation, it all increases. So what can we do? Water quality control is crucial. That's one thing. Wetland development is a second one in connection to the lake. Restore your connections where you can with the other systems and think on a landscape scale, not just on a lake scale, but on a landscape scale and maybe even in an international context. So lake management is important. Water quality and lower nut the lower nutrient loads impose certain problems to our lake. So the targets should be changed. And this is something for the discussion later. Now, I should stop. Thank you very much.